Romans chapter 5. It was nicely read, but we're going to just look at the first verse. Romans chapter 5, the 12th verse. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. I feel like reading it again. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. If man didn't sin, we would live longer than 969 years as Methuselah lived. And so, my dear sister, you would have just started living. Think about it. But sin is the intruder, and it has destroyed what God has started. Father, glorify your name today. Thank you for your saving grace, the gift of salvation, and the privilege of calling you Lord and Savior. Bless us today, and bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. want to share um, on the subject for a short time, the fact of sin. The fact of sin. I'm going to call the word Hama theology, or what we call the doctrine of sin, is often treated as a branch of anthropology. That's the science of man. Hama theology is derived from several Greek terms used to express the idea of sin. That of harmathia, which means missing the mark. The term is applicable to sin both as an act and as a state or condition. It is a deviation from the way or the end appointed by Almighty God. The fact of sin is fundamental in Christian theology. Any tendency to minimize the seriousness of sin has its consequences in a less exalted view of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The great three or the, the three great central truths of the Bible. We always know the Bible speaks about God as creator, speaks of the fact that sin, that all of us, we have sinned, and it also speaks of redemption. All of them, God, sin, redemption, are interrelated. The same time, inseparable as to our view of salvation. You cannot understand salvation. But we have sinned against God, but Jesus Christ has redeemed man from his sin. My first point to you is this. The historical narrative of the fall of man in the Old and New Testament. In Genesis chapter 3, and it's important to look at it. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, You shall not eat of it. God didn't say the other part. Neither shall he touch it. Lest he die. All God say you shall not eat. 
Let's look now on the fourth verse. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God's commandry, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did it, and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did it. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves, fig leaves together, and made them aprons. God said, you shall not eat of that tree. Adam and Eve, they concocted something because they allowed the serpent to deceive them. Eve was deceived. Adam following that deception, and both of them sinned against God. As I said early on, if Adam and Eve had not sinned against God, then you and I would not have known of death. Think about it. We would have been, listen, a lot of children, a lot of people would be on the planet. And somebody said, well, you see, there would not have been space enough. God will make that. That's not a problem. God prepared a garden. Everything was beautiful. But you see, the devil is always a tempter. The Bible says he has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But God has come so that you and I, we can have life and have it more abundant. I want to say the whole idea of the fall of man it is not a series of myths or allegorical accounts. It is clearly taught in the word of God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Paul writing to the Corinthians says, But I fear, lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I fear that for the church. Psalm 51, 5. Paul, not Paul, but, but the psalmist David said, after he sinned, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. In sin, my mother conceived me. Then in verse chapter 58, sorry, and verse 3 of the same psalm, you know this, he says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. You don't have to teach a child to lie. From the very womb, listen, birth, the moment you give, you give birth to that child, that child lies. He steals. He wants to fight. Negative things. Why? Because, you see, we are shaped like that. Sin causes us to do the wrong thing. And that is why it's so important that you and I, we look to God for help as we live in a world like ours today. That's why we need to pray for our children. That's why you need to pray for your families. That's why you ask for prayer for your family. Because the devil is on the prowl. He's attacking every home. I don't know of a home in Antigua that the devil is not attacking. I don't know of an institution or schools, our, our, our courts, our colleges, that the enemy not attacking. Think of one school in Antigua that the enemy is not present. You know of any perfect teachers? Any perfect headmaster, headmistresses? You know of any? Any perfect students? I don't know of a perfect school. What I do know is that we have problems on our hands every day. The, white, the fighting, the wars, and we watch the things that are happening all started way back there when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And you and I, we are suffering the consequence of their decision. So because this is not a myth or something allegorical, 
we're going to point to you that sin, the whole idea of the narrative, historical nar narrative of the fall of man in the Old and as well as reading the New Testament, that indeed is factual. Look at the first. We find the Garden of Eden. Was it not a real place? Yes. Genesis 2.9. Sorry, Genesis 2.8. We begin with Genesis 2.8. We notice that this way, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Adam didn't have to plant it. God did it for him. And I wish that we depend on God more for agriculture here in Antigua. You know why I say we depend on him? We pray that God will send rain upon the land. If God doesn't send rain, listen, doesn't matter the sea water you get, you can't match to God's reign. And, and a God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had what? Form. And all he said to the man, just dress it. So in other words, we know there was a God of Eden. A special environment. What a perfect place. I like farming. I like to put my hand in the soil and get them dirty. I like when I see my cucumbers coming. I like when I see my lettuce. Not that I'm saying you should come and peep over my fence and look at what I'm doing. <laughs> but I enjoy seeing crops. I enjoy that. My banana tree, I'm not good at it now. Notice they're dying out. Might have to go to the Ministry of Agriculture and let them advise me. But, but the point I'm making is that God placed them in a perfect environment, the Garden of Eden. So there was a garden. Secondly, we know, it's not a myth, it's a fact. We notice there's a tree of life. Genesis 2.9. In Genesis 9, it says, And out of the ground may the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. First, we find the tree of life. What's the tree of life? Communication of life to man. As man would constantly depend on God. The reason for the tree of life, God wanted man to depend solely on him. So as man would depend on God, look to God, things would happen. You know, today, people think they have arrived. And no longer do we need God in our lives. But you and I, we need the living God. In him we live and we have our very existence. And so man would have depended on God. God would walk with man in the cool of the day. And so he placed there the tree of life. So man would live on and live for a long time. Never know death. But then, the Bible teaches in verse, in verse 9, the same verse, that there is also apart from the tree of life, there was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you notice, the tree of knowledge of good and evil represented a knowledge about evil, not a knowledge of evil in personal experience. Man knew no evil. It was a knowledge about evil. There's a difference. Having a knowledge about evil and not a knowledge of evil in personal experience. When God created Adam and Eve, they were perfect beings. There were no evil within them. There were no sin within them. But when the enemy came in the Garden of Eden, that's when sin came about. And some people blame God and said, well, why did God make Adam and Eve? Why did he allow sin to be there? It's very simple. Man's position was to be as a servant and steward and not a God. In other words, dependency in God. God made man to worship him. And the moment we keep our eyes on God, things will happen positively. You know, if all Antiguans will turn to God, this would be the best island in the entire world. Thank you, my brother. I hear that loud. Amen. If antique, would you imagine that? All Antiguans turn to God. Other islands would want to run and ask the prime minister, what's happening in this country? 
something is happening. Would it be a nice thing if the Prime Minister gave his heart to God? Thank you, you want it to happen. Would it be a nice thing if the opposition gave his heart to God? Would it be a nice thing if all the parliamentarians, before they go to parliament, that they will meet and pray and say, God, lead us, lead us, guide us? Things would happen. Some people kept quiet. But things would have happened. And any nation that begins to recognize God. You see, when God created man, dependency. Man who should have depended on God. That's why he placed in the Garden of Eden. He placed with it certain guidelines. He gave certain guidelines, sorry. And he said to Adam and Eve, follow me. And if you follow me, you'll never run in trouble. So we notice there's the Garden of Eden, not a myth, real place. We also realize the tree of life. We also realize that the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We also notice that there was also a serpent. Genesis 3, 1 through to 8. And we read the passage earlier. There was a serpent. He was the, listen what he said, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He was more subtle, deadly. Yea, had God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And we're going to stop at that verse. The first thing that the devil did was to create doubt in Eve's mind. And the devil has a good way of creating doubts in our children's mind. And that is why when you send them to school, you need to pray with them. You need to tell them the truth. Because there are people going to create doubts in their mind. The devil works to teach us to, you know that? The devil works to students and works to anybody. Sometimes just a neighbor. It's amazing what the devil is doing today. How he tend to control our young people. And not only the young he's controlling, but the middle age. And he controls some old folks as well. Pray that you reach 70. That's not too old, sister. You're still young. But the devil, I'm sure along the track, he has been attacking you. And my sister would have testified, I've been through many trials. I've been through temptation. There are times when the devil, he has knocked me around. But thank God, though I've been knocked down, but I've not been knocked out. In the midst of it, God has been faithful. And you have a testimony this morning of the faithfulness and the goodness of Almighty God. But the devil is real. And he's attacking every church in Antigua. He's attacking our governments throughout the world. We look what's happening in the United States with our colleges. And we wonder to ourselves, my God, when will it stop? And some of us, we said, well, that's the United States problem. But I tell you, when they cough, we're going to get the cold. And that's why we need to pray as well. So we not only pray for Antigua and Barbuda, but we pray for other islands. And we pray for the Middle East conflict. Because if no food coming our way, we're in trouble. I guess we got to stay close to Dominica as well. They will produce, help us with the food. But the serpent, if you notice, he was very subtle. Chapter 3 of Genesis. He was one of the, who was the serpent? He was one of the higher created animals which Satan used to secure attention and conversation with Eve. That was the serpent. It was just one of the higher created animals that the devil, he did use to secure attention and conversation with Eve. Be careful where your minds go. Be careful of time you spend with the neg with negative ones. The devil has a way of infiltrating our minds. He has a way of destroying the younger ones. Be careful where you go. Be careful at school. Be careful about the company you keep. Be careful about those gangs you see. Be careful. They twist your mind. 
When others are drinking and smoking, you don't have to do it. I tell people I went to school like anyone. One thing I've never done. I said I'm not going to smoke. I didn't grow up seeing my mom or dad smoke. And I've never put a cigarette to my mouth. I said I will never be drinking Cavalier. Or some of the other thing. I know people promote it. But I said, okay, any strong drink, I'm not going to drink it. You might say, well, I'm living in the 17th century. I'd rather live in the 17th century and go to heaven than be so in the 21st century and going nowhere. But you see, man was tempted by a spiritual being external to himself. That's how man was tempted. So he was tempted. That temptation did not come from within. But man was tempted by an external being. Think about it. A spiritual being coming from the outside. And that's how the devil that worked through that serpent and got Eve's attention. And when Eve tasted that fruit, and you might say what the fruit was. The Bible says fruit, and we stop there. And he brought it to her husband and said, listen, honey, boy, this is good. I've never tasted anything like it. And look at Adam. Adam said, wow. And if we saw a little thing last Sunday morning here. You see, he was so beautiful. Because perfect woman. Perfect man. That's the only two perfect people we read about. Other persons were not perfect. But they were perfect. Perfect environment. Perfect garden. Perfect God. Everything perfect. But this external spiritual being came in. And he messed up Adam and Eve. And that is why be careful with the things we listen to, the music and the places that you go. The mystical figure of the serpent furnished the instrumentality to which the temper, tempter gained access to our four parents. Mystical figure. But let's look at the, the, the necessity of man's probation. Why probation? You see, temptation was permitted. And I want to hear this. Temptation was permitted because in no other way could human obedience be tested and perfected. Why did God allow Adam and Eve to be tempted? God told them before, don't listen to the enemy. He's a deceiver. So God warned them. God said, protect yourself. I'm your leader. Don't listen to the enemy. But God opened the door because we are not robots. Aren't you glad that you are not a robot? I'm glad for that. We have the power of choice. We choose between doing the right thing or the wrong thing. It's a choice. You choose to kill a person. And some people, when you, if you kill a person, it's not a mistake. I mistakenly killed someone or murdered someone. Use the word murder. No. Many things, they are planned before the act. Adam and Eve, they were forewarned. But they did not listen. So temptation has always been part of us. You and I will be tempted. Young lady, you'll be tempted. Young man, you'll be tempted. When you're 100 years of age, you'll be tempted. Tempted. Jesus was tempted. Am I right? Yes, he was tempted. Did he sin? No. And some people said, well, he's God. That's why he did not sin. Well, if he's God, he can protect you from sinning as well. Because he's God. So don't go around there saying that. Because God is God, but I'm a human being. God made us, and he can protect us. And he told Adam and Eve, they were perfect. Do not listen to the enemy. But the enemy came in like a wave, like a flood. And he destroyed them. Man sinned because he made that choice to sin. Genesis 3, 6 tells us clearly. And when the woman saw, ladies, be careful what you see. You have that sort of tendency that you can see more than the men it seems. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. Everything she saw. And a tree to be what? Desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof. 
and she did it. And then when the husband came along, he gave unto her husband with her, and both did eat. You might blame Eve, but you can't blame Eve alone. What if Adam did not? Things might have changed. But Adam and Eve decided, Adam decided to follow his wife Eve. Was it that she was so beautiful? Was it that she was so influential? Was it that the sin as a woman? You know, many ladies can cause men to do some funny things. When ladies say, it's true. And there are some very nice ladies here, and they say, Amen, Pastor. Amen. <laughs> it's amazing what a woman will cause a man to do. I've watched some men, and sometimes ladies, they come in and meet the man, say, oh. like they were thinking straight at one time, let the woman pass, and they stop thinking straight. I say, what happened? They say, oh, that woman over there, I don't know, I <laughs> problems. Leave the woman alone. Ask God to help you. Ask God to guide you. So many men have known. They're in scripture as well. Samson. Remember this story? I don't have to go into that one. It was a woman. Think about Joseph. But here a young man was able to say what? No. Let's say together. No. When Mrs. Spotify said no, no one will see us. Joseph said what? No. And that is why you and I many times have to say what? No. No. And when you say no, me no. But it's going to take God within you to make that decision. Man sin because it was his own choosing. Sin. What is sin? John Wesley said it is a voluntary transgression of the known law. And then Dr. A. H. Strong, a theologian, says sin is a lack of conformity to the moral law of God, either in act, disposition, or state. That's what sin is. Move on quickly. I'm closing now. The fall and the consequences. Sin begun in the separation of the will of man from the will of God. My will against God's will. The separation of the will of man, the will of God. As a result, estrangement from God. Enslavement to Satan. And the loss of divine grace. You see, the birth of an evil conscience. When sin comes on the inside, there's the birth of an evil conscience. You know, some people say they have no conscience at all. Because evil has taken over. Some people do you something wrong that they'll never sad about it. People hurt you sometimes, they don't even care. Because Satan has controlled even that conscience, their second guide. Some people say, let your conscience be your guide. You cannot allow your conscience to be your guide. Let the Holy Spirit be your guide. Because if you are going to allow that conscience, some people's conscience, they have been deadened, darkened, dumb, dull, seared. And that is why you cannot trust your conscience. I call it a second guide. Let the Holy Spirit be our guide. That is why we pray to the Holy Spirit. We pray to God the Father. We pray to his Son. And we say, Lord, guide us today. Lead us today. Help me not to fall in sin. Help me to make right choices. Then we could see the loss of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Begun in a life of external discord and internal misery. You know, it's why people are so miserable today. Sin. Have you ever been around a person? My God, they're miserable in the morning. They're miserable at, at, at lunchtime. They're miserable in the evening. Misery. Do you enjoy that company? No. Sin makes us miserable. And that is why when you're a Christian, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Things might be going wrong. You might not have enough money on your bank account. You might not be able to pay your bills. But by the grace of God, God has been good to you. You rejoice in the midst of even financial death. Why? Because you can rejoice in a God who gives joy in the midst of your, of your sorrows. God can help you through. 
then as a result of sin, guilt, state or condition of one who has transgressed the law. When people sin against God, there's guilt, supposed to be guilt. But some people, because their consciences have been seared, like with a hot iron, burnt out conscience. So the fact is, okay, they have no guilt. But as well, when you sin against God, there's condemnation based upon God's uh, uh, disapproval. You see, God, he condemns sin. God does not justify sin. He condemns it. He hates sin. That's why after Adam and Eve sinned against God, he had to drive them out of the Garden of Eden. What a moment it must have been. Think about it. So when a person sinned against God, it's a terrible moment. When you commit an atrocity, you're supposed to feel bad about it. Don't go around smiling and say, ha, 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 I've done something terrible. But that's all right. It's not okay with God. The soul that sin shall surely die. God condemns sin. Sin is an, any action that is contrary to the law of God. The Bible says, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. You have this sin of commission, this sin of omission. Some things that you ought to do and you're not doing it. Listen, that's sin in the eyes of God. Sin is any breaking of God's law. Sin not only deceives, but sin hardens the heart. So when you're deceived by sin, your heart gets hardened. Some people have some stout heart, boy. Hard, hard. And the more you sin, the more you commit sin, the more God attempts to harden that heart. But thank God, grace and mercy is available today. You can have peace and forgiveness with God. And then the Bible says that the penalty of sin is what? Death. Genesis 2, 17 makes it very clear. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. Lear, hear this. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt what? Surely die. Both physically and spiritually. Every one of us have to die someday. Some of us will never reach my sister's age. Some of us might pass it. You never know. Some of us already passed that age. Because 70 is supposed to be a young age, you know. If man did not sin, could you imagine if we have another thousand of age, people would be trans- 3,000 years old. You wouldn't be counting the year, years? No. Because there are perhaps no passport. We'll just travel where you want to go. Huh? Nobody going to count it. But when sin came in, it robs man of God's blessing. So we can die physically. But listen, if you can die spiritually, you can be cut off from God. And that is why in closing this message, and even in this service today, you and I got to realize that we have to give an account to Almighty God someday for the life that you continue to live or that you have lived. The truth of the matter is, now is the time to serve God. If it's ever a time you need to serve God, today is the day. Let him have his way. The Holy Spirit is a bond of union between the soul of man and his maker. By the withdrawal of his spirit, man immediately loses that fellowship with God. But Christ, he has come to restore that fellowship. Aren't you glad that fellowship can be restored? Yes, it can. Shall we all stand together, please?